Welcome everyone to this month's uh, webinar in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. My name is Matt Bauhoff. I'm the director of the center and also a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. To learn more about us and the research we do in the center, please visit our website. We also encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn and to subscribe to our YouTube channel. The center is a group of uh, principal investigators, students, and, and research associates uh, that collaborate together. Here are a few of the faculty uh, that are in the center. Uh, most are in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. In the center, we do a wide variety of research, uh, many different subsurface applications, technical disciplines, and we apply many different engineering tools as you see here. We collaborate with industry in a lot of different ways. One of those is with our industrial affiliate programs. A few of those are listed below. Our monthly webinars are informative industry-driven webinars by researchers and collaborators with the center. Uh, they are hosted the second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams, although we do upload all of our webinars to our YouTube channel. So if you're unable to uh, catch our, our, our webinar or you'd like to share with some of your colleagues, uh, please visit our YouTube channel. Uh, we have a couple of upcoming webinars which are to be determined. Those are in January and February. Uh, before introducing our speaker, I would uh, request that if you have any questions, Please uh, make sure that your Q&A section is open and to post your questions in the Q&A. You can do that at any time during the webinar and then they'll be answered at the end. Uh, but today's speaker is Dr. Alberto Lopez. So he is the, um, he holds a PhD in petroleum engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and received his bachelor's and master's degree in petroleum engineering from the Nat National Autonomous University of Mexico. He has more than 24 years of industry experience in the uh, areas of, as a field engineer, design engineer, and technology leader for onshore and offshore drilling. Uh, he has occupied several faculty positions, uh, including most recently here at the University of Texas at Austin, and has won multiple teaching awards. His research activity focuses on unconventional shale reservoir characterization, geomechanics, and hydraulic fracturing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alberto. Okay, thank you uh, everyone. Good afternoon. So uh, thank you, Matt, for, for introducing me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a subject that is, uh, I think is very uh, important for us here in, in the U.S. because of the unconventional resources we are trying to, you know, to get uh, uh, to um, uh, production from them. So uh, the important part of this is I am going to use something that um, information is not always uh, available from these uh, unconventional resources. So I'm going to use LWD in order to see how we can use that information for characterization from these uh, resources. So let's start. Uh, please remind uh, uh, a reminder that um, uh, uh, place your questions in the QI section, and I'm going to try to do my best to answer them at the end of the presentation. So let's start. Uh, the outline of this presentation is as follows. I'm going to give you some introduction about why is the aim of this work. Um, I want to talk about some um, um, reservoir pressure estimation that uh, it was done uh, uh, in previous years. I think uh, uh, what I'm going to present today is uh, um, some uh, some part of, of my research that, that started with some uh, uh, material in the past. Uh, it doesn't end here, so uh, I'm going to, to to show you some of the stages of my of my research. So when you showing you some uh, how how did do, did we work in this geomechanical characterization, some organic matter content, how do we relate information we were able to gather in order to account for this important um, um, uh, aspect, and then some final remarks that that in my opinion uh, they are interesting and then we should follow in order to characterize better these resources. Uh, what you see here is an introduction material is something that I captured today. 
it is interesting that uh, when I was looking at, at uh, JPT today, um, it says, uh, well, first, in order to to um, to drill horizontal wells and to get production from there, we need to plan, design and execute a horizontal well and to plan the in, induced fractures that we are going to try to from from, from, from we are going to try to obtain a uh, production and we need to uh, to position them on what we call the sweet spots. We are going to define later what is what is what we consider sweet spots. Um, apparently, this tax seems to be uh, satisfied when we drill in within the producing zone. But today, as I was telling you, I found this interesting information in JPT, and there is a recent study that should, suggests that your steers uh, they often miss the target. So um, let me let me. Um, um, See this. I am trying to um, here. So uh, I am using the, the the laser point. So notice these uh, two scenarios here that uh, we have unconventional and conventional. So this is the target, the the black the black line that you see here. This is an exercise that was done, and you see that uh, in in the study that was performed, a lot of the steering uh, activity it goes outside of the target. So now just imagine if we want to uh, 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 fracture a well that follows this path. Well, basically uh, we are going to be fracturing outside of the target, outside of those called sweet spots. So uh, I added this um, slide today because it is very timely. I think it is useful. It is it gives a, it gives us a good a view of what it is happening and how we can easily a, a loss to what we are trying to do that is hit the sweet spots in these unconventional reservoirs. So continuing with this introduction, uh, um, something that we also need to recognize is the heterogeneity of these scenarios in order to try to um, find those sweet spots. So uh, we, um, in this study or in this analysis, we try to define sweet spots as interval with intervals that contain high or higher organic matter uh, than uh, let's say average or other intervals, and here it is just in the case. This is a this is real information. This is the uh, the path of a real well. You see, you can see here where it was drilled. It is well, it, it is based on information. So um, uh, this this well was tried to get uh, confined and to get in into this uh, formation. So apparently the target was achieved. So uh, assuming that we are able to do that, that uh, get contained into the into the formation, we also we need to recognize that the heterogeneity for, of formation uh, is it, it plays a role. So that is what we are going to continue talking about. Um, with the with this analysis and and with this introduction, then um, uh, what I'm going to talk is about how we um, um, include the quantification of reservoir pressure along these horizontal wells. Because typically we know that uh, uh, this reservoir pressure is uh, obtained using well-known uh, reservoir engineering techniques uh, um, and we compute a unique value. That is what we usually do. Um, some of the reasons is because we don't get uh, enough information from, from horizontal uh, wells because uh, there is a risk. Uh, operators, they feel uh, some risk. The, the risk is, is real. So um, uh, this is not a common practice, and what it is done, uh, not all the tools that we need to characterize formations and to evaluate formations, they are run in the open hole. So uh, that is why information from LWD plays an important role, and that is what I is, going to, is going to be analyzed today. So we have information. Uh, it is important to mention that we didn't have information from sonic logs and other important evaluation formation evaluation tools. So LWD plays a, a, a some significant role in this. Um, so uh, we postulate that um, in order to increase um, uh, production, we need to uh, and, and to have successful hydraulic fracturing jobs, we need to hit this uh, uh, so-called um, uh, sweet spot areas. And then uh, information from wells that they were drilling an unconventional shale um, was collected. It was not, uh, I mean, we, we worked what, what we had at hand. And here it is, uh, what, uh, once uh, this introduction material is given, so let's start talking about how we handle this information in order to obtain 
reservoir pressure along the horizontal wellbore. So uh, let's start with reservoir pressure estimation. Um, uh, first thing, uh, we use uh, again uh, uh, information from LWD. Uh, this information from LWD uh, served uh, three different purposes. One, it was introduced into the diffusivity equation to obtain reservoir pressure distribution along the horizontal wellbore. We also used this uh, information to create what we call a synthetic acoustic log in order to try to characterize the geomechanical properties of uh, the formation uh, for this uh, unconventional uh, shale. And uh, also we attempt uh, some correlation with the total organic carbon along the horizontal section of the wellbore using some techniques that they were proposed and we, we apply uh, in this uh, analysis. So let's start with these uh, three ideas and see how we handle that information. So continuing with uh, reservoir pressure estimation along the horizontal well, uh, uh, I just wanted to include this slide because, uh, uh, you know, there are methods uh, before drilling, while drilling, after drilling. So uh, I'm not going to discuss these methods. Some of the methods that they are after drilling, they are based on uh, well logging information. So information that we have at hand and we use using some um, uh, techniques that they are uh, useful and they are uh, um, used on, on nowadays on, on industry. Well, we decided to move away from those uh, techniques because they have some shortcomings. Uh, uh, most of them, uh, I am not telling that all of them, but most of them, they are based on empirical formulation. So uh, we, we decided to move away from those uh, approaches. Uh, in, in that way, we created our own uh, uh, methodology and we were able to implement that information and, and that methodology into the horizontal section of the wellbore to obtain or a uh, pressure profile, formation pressure profile. First of all, we have to uh, uh, deal with information, uh, typical information obtained from uh, well logging in a vertical uh, wellbore. So, um, uh, this slide basically uh, what is trying to tell us is uh, I, I, I was trying to give you some uh, a quick uh, sh uh, quick shot or quick uh, information about what how did we uh, this is a paper we we presented uh, uh, long ago so uh, it's a proposal it's a methodology that was proven that was um, basically uh, using uh, one of the solutions of the diffusivity equation we use that that uh, the equation that is on top. Uh, and we call uh, we use some uh, that we call uh, normalized values of uh, formation and fluid properties. Uh, in this case, uh, this uh, treatment is is showing you how to use the resistivity log. Uh, we can also use uh, acoustic log and 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 probably a res a density log is also uh, if it is available we can use it. In this case, I am showing you uh, the details on how we introduce these uh, properties that they were measured from from the from the uh, well log uh, um, information into the question so here it is uh, not much detail that not is not the purpose of the presentation today to discuss the details of that but this is the final equation that we are using and this equation is useful to compute uh, uh, what it is called pore pressure and at the time we are in the reservoir well basically uh, it is the reservoir pressure so we are using this expression that is here at the end of the presentation i am giving you some references in order for those of you who are interested in going deeper into this information you will find a very useful um, information on that so um, what we were able to do uh, basically we work with information from the vertical uh, wells that they are available uh, in this case, there was a pilot, vertical pilot well. So uh, we got that information. We used uh, our treatment to con to obtain pore pressure and reservoir pressure. You know, always that we work we work with indirect indirect methods. We need to calibrate. Well, we we calibrate with information that that was at hand. That was a, a pore pressure or reservoir pressure measure with some um, conventional downhole pressure gauge. Unfortunately, we didn't have better calibration measurements to to uh, improve or, or or you know the calibration step. So uh, we calibrate our curve, and once we the, the the it was calibrated on the vertical well, we apply our equation uh, with the uh, parameters that they were obtained 
to the horizontal section of the well. This is real information from the well. This is the trajectory of the well. And then uh, this is, let me show this uh, um, 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 uh, short uh, um, close up of the, of the plot. I'm going to discuss it later, but I wanted to show you how the profile looks like. This, uh, uh, this uh, pressure profile, that is the reservoir pressure profile along the horizontal section of the wellbore, well, was obtained uh, using the resistivity log that uh, was, uh, well, the resistivity measurements that they were obtained from the LWD. So that is a, a first view of how pressure looks like. So it is not continuous, it is not unique. And you see there are, uh, according to this treatment, there are some uh, big jumps. So you see this pressure is uh, approximately 3,300 PSI. So it is somehow in agreement. Some, let's say if we, if we take the average here, probably we are around or we are close to that, but there are some sections of the well bore that uh, pressure definitely goes, uh, goes down and some others they go slightly up. So I'm going to discuss this figure later. I just wanted to present to you this uh, at this step of the presentation because I am going to jump now to the geomechanical uh, characterization. So how how we did that in the horizontal well bore? Well, first we need to again uh, uh, deal with the information that we have at hand uh, from the vertical well or vertical wells that they are available. If you don't have a pilot well, you can use probably information from the wells that are close to that. So we were able to compute a uh, young modulus, Poisson ratio, brittleness of rock, that is important parameter if we want to characterize formations. And also we were able to model fracture pressure for completion engineers who are willing to, you know, to uh, improve um, uh, the fracturing design. So le let's continue with that. Um, um, if you see in vertical well wars, uh, usually we have the typical uh, um, well logging information that we get. Um, resistivity logs, uh, acoustic logs, the, 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 the dual that it is useful to obtain the, the two different uh, acoustic velocities in order to characterize uh, geomechanical formations and some radioactive tools, they were uh, uh, obtained and we had that information from the vertical log using conventional logging techniques. What happens when we go to the horizontal wellbore uh, or the section of the of this uh, horizontal section of these wellbores? Well, we don't have the same information. We don't have the same tools. We need to rely on what it is obtained from LWU technique. That usually it doesn't mean that it's always the same. It, it some, sometimes we have some other uh, uh, um, uh, measurements. Sometimes we don't have. But usually we have resistivity, gamma ray, and neutron values. So uh, acoustic tools, uh, usually they are uh, not deployed um, during or after uh, drilling. So that information from acoustic logs, particularly the, the, the acoustic uh, dual uh, information is not, is not available. Something that limits um, our capability to, um, you know, to characterize formation from the standpoint of uh, geomechanics. So what is what we did? Uh, Again, from the vertical information, this is uh, this is the real uh, log from the. Um, uh, if you notice, I am just uh, showing the um, reservoir now. So this is the what we what we obtain from the from from the logs from the conventional logs that the dipole sonic uh, tool. Uh, we were able to to as you know to measure the compressional wave, the velocity of the compressional wave, and the velocity of the shear wave. Both, uh, when we deal with them, here are some equations that they are used. Uh, we were able to compute Poisson ratio and a young modulus. Also, uh, you can you can use acoustic impedance if if you are if you are willing to to deal with that uh, parameter. That is very important also to uh, to characterize formations. We use uh, acoustic log and also the density log that was run in the vertical wells. So these are uh, values that they were measured. How, do, how did we use these values? Well, um, uh, we, we wanted to create some something that we call the synthetic acoustic log. In that way, um, we use some uh, regression analysis techniques uh, uh, using linear, quadratic, and cubic equations. Uh, in order to try to, um, you know, to mimic the compressional, the velocity of the compressional wave and the velocity of the shear wave. 
At the end, we, uh, after uh, doing this analysis, we decided to use the quadratic model because the cubic equation did not provide much better uh, accuracy. So what I'm going to show you next are these results. Well, first I'm going to show you the equations. This is the type of equations for this particular case. You cannot, you cannot claim uh, that these equations are going to be useful everywhere. These are for the particular conditions that we found in that particular well, or probably it can be in that particular area and formation. So uh, uh, with those equations, we were able to, to compute these uh, interval transit times for the, for the compressional and for the shear waves. So these equations, uh, when we use, if you notice the inputs, they, are, they come from the LWD, the gamma ray resistivity, and uh, uh, and from the neutron neutron tool. So these in the, these equations they can the, now they are ready to be fed by uh, information coming from LWD. So um, this is what we did, and um, we were just trying to calibrate. Now that we have the equations to uh, create the synthetic log, uh, notice that in these slides. Basically, here are the compressional waves, and here uh, the computed values of Poisson ratio. We calibrate uh, uh, the compressional wave, we calibrate the shear wave, and you notice there are there is a very good matching between both. Uh, the blue ones are measured values in the vertical well. The orange ones, uh, the orange dots that you see there, they are the synthetic values computed with the equations I showed you in the slide, uh, in the previous slide. The same thing for the shear, uh, the shear um, transit time. Uh, and once we have these values, well, we can compute Poisson ratio and your modulus. And uh, again, we can compare uh, measured values versus uh, synthetic uh, values that we created. There are uh, uh, there is a very good agreement, particularly with these uh, two values. So once we were able to check that our calibration is valid, uh, what we wanted to do is to move to the horizontal well. It means it is valid for the... Uh, and notice also, it's important to remark that it is all only done on the reservoir. You cannot take all the data that you have from the log. You need to, uh, um, you, you need, you need to concentrate on that particular uh, um, interval of interest, and there is where you need to make your your regression analysis. So, one, with these values that they were uh, the calibration part, um, basically um, we have the elastic parameters that they are useful to uh, perform a geomechanical analysis. And then is what we tried before. It's, excuse me. First, we attempt a geomechanical characterization of formation all along the horizontal or horizontal section of the well. And secondly, uh, as I showed you before, we were able to compute pressure using the resistivity log that comes from the LWD. And uh, with this synthetic acoustic log, we wanted also to compute reservoir pressure and then compare both. So these are the that is what we are going to see in the following slides. First, the geomechanical characterization. Second, uh, uh, how the, uh, if the, the the pressure we were able to uh, estimate using resistivity log from LWD compares with the reservoir pressure we were, we were able to compute using our synthetic acoustic log. So let's go. And we are going to see in the following slide several figures like that. I was trying to show you the most representative ones. I mean, there is a lot of information I, I, I could share here, but I was trying just to show you the most representative one. So you see here, once we have uh, or or uh, or synthetic acoustic log, we were able to compute uh, both parameters, Young modulus and Poisson ratio along the horizontal wellbore. And you see that um, this is the wellbore. This is the horizontal uh, developed uh, depth. Uh, this is Young uh, modulus. This is Poisson's ratio. And you see how definitely it cannot be considered that it is constant. It, it changes from uh, 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 point to point as we move along the horizontal wellbore, as we move into the formation. Well, that particular, uh, those particular, val particular values for uh, young, young modulus and Poisson ratio, they change and then change significantly. So we are going to discuss more about them uh, uh, later. So uh, let me continue. Um, 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 so 
uh, for this geomechanical reservoir characterization, uh, it is widely accepted that uh, brittleness uh, is, a, is a very good parameter to, to characterize formations in order to continue with the next step that is the hydraulic fracturing job. So I decided to use this approach. There are many in the market. Uh, not necessarily this is the best, but I decided to continue with this approach proposed by Greaser and Bray. So uh, uh, if you notice the equations, they are very simple. They are the, 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 the typical equations that we use in, in formation evaluation to measure some of the parameters of interest. So each interpreter is going to get uh, different results. It's something that is uh, uh, part of the interpretation of, of logs. And, and part of formation evaluation process. So um, using these very simplistic equations, we were able to compute what it is called the brittleness average of formation. And you see here along the horizontal section of the wellbore, it is uh, notice that it's a, it's, it is a very long horizontal section. It is measured in meters. So uh, you see how the brittleness average in general, as it uh, uh, typically the interpretation of this is that if, if the brittleness goes higher, formation is going to be easy to fracture, and then uh, we should uh, uh, be confident that this formation should be uh, should behave well. Well, it's something that uh, not necessarily is going to happen, and I, I'm going to discuss that uh, later uh, in this unconventional uh, uh, reservoirs. So please take a look on the behavior of the brittleness average of the, on this horizontal well, and again, you can see that there is a big, 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 big changes along, and you see at the end of the well, um, it, it follows some, some, some particular uh, behavior. So uh, let's continue. Let's continue. And uh, what I wanted to show you here, once I showed you the first part that was the uh, um, computation of a John modulus and a um, Poisson ratio, and as consequence, the brittleness of the formation, I wanted to show you the comparison between calculation. This is a, a curve of a reservoir pressure along the horizontal section. The blue line, as it is said here, or the blue dots, because they are points computed every single um, every single fit, I think, is what they are computed. So uh, it's a very, uh, it's not a line. They, they are dots. So they are uh, everywhere. As, as the LWD is measuring points, we are able to compute those values. So the, 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 the blues are resistivities. Uh, 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 they are uh, formation pressure computed using the resistivity uh, information coming directly from the LWD. And the red dots, they are, this is, they, they belong to the reservoir pressure compute using or um, um, synthetic acoustic log. Uh, we can uh, notice differences. We can uh, um, uh, see a lot of uh, similarities. Uh, and I'm going to try to go to the discussion of that. Of course, everyone is going to look different things. I was trying to concentrate on some area because of the limit of time to for this presentation. Um, and here you have some observations that I, I wanted to highlight in this presentation. I probably uh, is the differences between the curves in this in this interval. Also, this is evident that in this interval there are differences probably here and probably also at the end of the well of the horizontal well. Well, you see. Um, uh, that um, uh, values are are very similar with differences. Uh, uh, so uh, the importance of this uh, uh, finding or, or or this plot is that uh, um, the similarities between the curves they tell us that um, we can use um, LWD resistivity obtained from LWD using the approach that uh, we propose in order to compute reservoir pressure along the horizontal wellbore. So that is a very good uh, achievement that we can get some uh, very good, uh, very good uh, values from uh, using uh, the proposed method that, that, that it is already published uh, somewhere. OK, so continuing with the geomechanical characterization of uh, this formation, uh, it is um, uh, generally accepted that intervals that, um, uh, that, that they have high brittleness, uh, and we are also proposing that if they have average pressure, 
they should be considered some of the intervals of interest, and we should take a look closely to that uh, to that uh, uh, information or to to those intervals. So you see here the Britain's average in this uh, in this part of the reservoir is high. So probably this is a good uh, region to fracture. You see probably at the end of the well, not necessarily the brittleness is, is as good as it is in this section. And here you have uh, a lot of uh, variations. So what about pressure? You see that pressure, there are some intervals here that they show uh, uh, some behavior. Um, what I am showing here, that it was information that was obtained after, I think in this well, uh, there were uh, 15 or 17 different stages with um, uh, clusters that they were, they were mostly equally spaced. Uh, not necessarily all of them, they were equal spaced, but uh, most of them, they were, they were equal spaced. Uh, I'm not an expert on the analysis of this, um, of this type of, of logs, but in general, they are run after hydraulic fracturing and after some uh, radioactive tracers, they have been injected during the hydraulic fracturing job. And this behavior, they, they, uh, for the experts who are able to analyze these logs, they, uh, this behavior tells you if formations they were able to, uh, let's say, to um, uh, accept or to receive that uh, or the extent of the hydraulic fracturing job. Uh, some people can, uh, uh, they are, you know, is the, this technique is not necessarily uh, uh, absolute, like anything is an indirect measurement, but some people uh, definitely it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tool that helps to evaluate hydraulic fracturing job or to monitor how uh, the hydraulic fracturing jobs were performed. So um, let's continue with information that is here. So um, with the geomechanical um, reservoir characterization, also it is um, uh, in general, generally accepted that high John modulus favor fracturability. So here you have the three, the three um, uh, computed values for brittleness, John modulus, and here I included Poisson ratio. So a uh, high uh, Poisson ratio are these values in this section, but notice that also in that section, uh, we have very high Poisson ratio, something that uh, um, not necessarily um, uh, there is a, also a common expression that we use in in in, in industry that we we said that uh, high high Poisson ratio and low excuse me high uh, John modulus and low Poisson ratio they should be uh, sick in order to have good hydraulic fracturing jobs. Well, there is a reason, right? If we go to the and we if we review. Uh, those equations that they are useful to compute hydraulic fracturing um, uh, gradients, well, uh, uh, we can find the, the answer to that. So um, notice that Poisson ratio are high in this interval as well. And, and as, as a consequence, the brittle average, the brittle average of the formation is, is really, really high. So uh, what else uh, can we do? Well, uh, after all that, uh, what what we did is uh, we also tried to um, to find some um, uh, fracture pressure. You see, the this is reservoir pressure along the horizontal well. This is fracture pressure along the horizontal well. We use one of the most uh, in 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 this. Um, in, uh, you see, there are some information that is missing. That is normal. There are some points. It is. Uh, the, the, the information was not filtered, so it is uh, uh, it, uh, as it comes from LWD and it is it was processed as as, as that. So um, in this analysis, uh, Poisson ratio and reservoir pressure are no longer assumed constant, something that uh, uh, usually it is done. Instead, this methodology al allows to include for overboard and stress uh, if we have density locks that usually we have them. So we can include into the treatment and also we can include the changes in geomechanical properties. That is why you see this behavior because uh, Poisson ratio is high. Then you see that if you want to fracture this formation for the completion engineer, he's going to notice that probably that formation is going to be slightly hard. You need to put some more power probably to fracture this formation. Um, so uh, and that is because of the heterogeneity of formation. So you see this is something that uh, uh, is, is nice, is, is, is apparently uh, not common to see. 
Uh, and uh, also uh, for those of you who are familiar with this uh, uh, type of uh, in vertical well seats, what we call the uh, uh, pore pressure versus fracture pressure, the operational uh, mod window, if we go to, to vertical wells, well, you probably do, for those of you who have expert eyes, you are going to see that there is something weird in that behavior. Well, that that weirdness is something that I am going to or, or we try to 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 explain, and that is what I am going to to attack in the following in the following slides. So, uh, what about organic matter? Because we are talking about unconventional resources. So what we did is we went to some techniques that they are uh, also valid. We we made some research and we followed some proposal from Peres and Altamar, um, uh, where they found that the, this type of correlation using uh, cross-plotted techniques. Uh, I also want to remind you that uh, in these horizontal wells, we don't have uh, a spectral gamma ray. Definitely, this is the tool that we should be run, but we don't run these tools, so we need to deal with what, what we have. And we have gamma ray, only the gamma ray. The gamma ray is, is, is not able to detect, uh, uh, you know, the different components that they have natural radiation. So we were unable to, to do that. So we, we had to use some other techniques and we went to these uh, cross plotting techniques. So based on that, I'm following this uh, uh, approach that it was proposed from, uh, from other uh, researchers. We found that there is a correlation between a uh, gamma ray brittleness and the high contents of, uh, of um, organic matter. So here it, here it is the correlation. We follow that approach. And with that approach, um, Basically, we were able to make some, uh, we cannot say conclusions, but with some inferences about, uh, uh, we postulate that uh, these uh, high talk values correspond to high brittleness and high gamma ray values. I know for, for those of you who, who, who know uh, 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 about uh, the spectral, uh, of course you can claim that that is uh, uh, not necessarily true because we are not measuring uranium, we are just measuring gamma ray and gamma ray can be affected by, uh, uh, you know, uh, the different type of clays and mineralogy that is there. But uh, based on, on this uh, um, approach of the uh, cross-plotting cross -plotting techniques that I showed you before, uh, we are confident that uh, this, uh, um, postulate, these postulates, uh, they can be, uh, they should be taken into account. Okay, so then uh, we also conclude that this interval that is here uh, with the high Britland average, with high uh, a gamma ray values, you see this is the gamma ray that was obtained from LWD as it uh, as it comes from the tool. They, it shows also very high values of gamma ray. So we conclude that this uh, particular interval is the best. Some others are of interest as well. And definitely the, the, the last part, the last section of the horizontal well world is something that seems to be not necessarily uh, very interesting. So uh, for those of you who, who are, are thinking about costs and, and how we should deal with this uh, spacing between fractures and how long the well should be, well, that is that is a, a, a good a good uh, um, way to, to analyze uh, this, um, this data. OK, so again, here it is pressure, uh, uh, reservoir pressure, fracture pressure, gamma ray as, as it is uh, recorded from LWD, and the brittleness of the uh, of the rock of the formation at, is what uh, as it was computed using the approach I mentioned uh, to you. So um, after that, um, also uh, we you, we continue using. There are there is much more about these uh, uh, cross plotting techniques. Uh, I am just showing you a couple of them. Um, more is coming. I mean, so uh, 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 as we talk, uh, much more uh, uh, and, and, and different uh, research is coming about how to deal with this uh, geochemistry of, of uh, uh, unconventional resources. Uh, here it is another cross plot technique talking about uh, how we could relate gamma ray versus Poisson ratio and how it, it relates to the high level of uh, organic matter in these unconventional, uh, unconventional resources. And uh, in general, this correlation also tells us that when we have a high gamma value rays and high, high Poisson ratio, we can associate that to high levels of organic matter. And, and let me, uh, uh, 
probably I, I want to go back. Let me see. No, I, I think I can continue. So uh, you can see that uh, again, I am showing you the same slides is uh, Poisson ratio. Well, I, I am including Poisson ratio now and gamma ray. And you see that in all these uh, um, uh, different um, ways that we are trying to characterize formation, these intervals, uh, uh, this interval or this section of the well seems to be the most uh, um, important section of, of that of that horizontal well. Of course, there are other intervals that they are of interest. Uh, probably also also here you see uh, gamma ray is not good in this section, but it's good here. And, and 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 the big the big question is what is happening at the end of the well should should uh, is something that we should uh, think about it okay so um, I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, the, the the things I wanted to highlight about about these uh, uh, slides so um, um, yes I think is Poisson ratio is uh, gamma ray and and, um, and and pressure so. Uh, let's continue with uh, what is next. Well, some final remarks. I think uh, it is important. Um, uh, I was trying to just get uh, um, uh, confined to the time. Uh, some final remarks about this research, uh, as, as I told you. Um, this is uh, some uh, part of, uh, of something that uh, um, uh, it has been done for the uh, past, uh, in, the, in the recent past. Um, so, um, it's, it is not the end. This is, is something that uh, we are still looking at how, how to deal with these unconventional resources. So here are some final remarks about uh, this presentation. So um, reservoir characterization based on this uh, Britain's average, uh, we suggest that should be a, a good uh, a good approach uh, for, for to follow. Probably some uh, people in industry. Uh, uh, can take this uh, and, and see if it, if it is uh, useful in the way it is done because it, it is uh, simple. It doesn't require uh, big computations or it doesn't require fancy uh, equations to, to, to make this uh, uh, methodology. So uh, in addition, when we are using this comprehensive approach, uh, it is uh, evident that we can characterize uh, horizontal wells and formations uh, from the standpoint of uh, reservoir pressure and geomechanics. So uh, we also uh, were able to claim that uh, this approach is effective, reliable, and uh, should be very useful for the completion engineer who is trying to allocate uh, clusters, perforations. If, if we go back to the uh, very first uh, uh, slide that I show you where we have a, a, a well, uh, that is not uh, uh, in, on target, and we have those uh, paths that they go in that geostering analysis that they go out of the of the formation completely. Just imagine if we want to fracture them usually using equally spaced fractures. Well, most of those fractures they are going to be completely out of the target. So uh, we should uh, we should look for more uh, uh, information before we go to the stage of hydraulic fracturing jobs, OK? So that is what it is proposed. Uh, in addition to that, I wanted also to state and to remark that uh, in situ stresses, uh, strength of rock, geomechanical rock parameters, and reservoir pressure are all done, uh, all of them taken into consideration in the modeling. Very important because we are trying to incorporate the most information we had, especially uh, that we, we didn't have much. I mean, so uh, we tried to incorporate everything we had at hand in this analysis, and, and I think that is what also uh, adds some value. Um, just to finish, um, um, uh, as you notice, we tried because we don't have the information from, from the spectral tool that can tell us much better information about organic content uh, uh, by measuring probably the quantifying the, the, the uranium contents of, of that those formation. Uh, we we you, we have to use the uh, some other indirect uh, procedures to see how these uh, organic contents they uh, affect the behavior of these uh, um, of these tools and how uh, they can be reflected in order to uh, allocate those uh, sweet spots uh, along the horizontal section. Um, 
some uh, final uh, thoughts is that uh, formation evaluation tools uh, should be uh, run more often in the horizontal well bores if we want to improve reservoir characteri characterization. Otherwise, uh, we are using all the time uh, indirect uh, uh, modeling techniques that, uh, uh, of course, they are not the, the best. We are trying to adapt. We are trying to, uh, to, you know, to get the best of these tools, but not necessarily they are the ones that we should be using. And definitely, we, more research is needed to evaluate geochemistry of these unconventional rocks. So, um, uh, just uh, uh, to finish my talk, I just wanted to to keep this uh, slide for a, for a few seconds for you guys to, if you want to go deeper in this material. This is these are some of the publications that uh, I am using for this uh, presentation. So probably you can find a, a, a lot of good information on these papers. Uh, and with that, uh, I think uh, we have time to, to some to some questions. I uh, I really want to thank for your attention, uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to try to address your questions as as in the in the best way I can. Just please remain, uh, re, uh, uh, to remind you that we are going to probably end uh, sharply at one or before one because there is a, a, a very important uh, worldwide event, is the, the World Cup, right? Soccer. So probably some of us, we want to escape quickly from this, from this uh, presentation. This is all I wanted to tell you guys. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, I'm going to try to answer them in the best way I can. Thank you. I see. Uh, it says uh, um, vertical trends in in PR and uh, Poisson ratio young moduli changes in reservoir interval. Is this change in properties driven by lithology, fluid, or pressure? Well, those change. Uh, I think they are driven by. Um, uh, most likely, in in my opinion, is lithology. Is uh, um, um, definitely lithology is what uh, um, what what uh, should be the the main uh, aspect that is uh, making those changes. So uh, also um, um, fluid, fluid definitely because uh, not necessarily fluid. I mean the 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 organic matter that is there. Remember, we are talking about unconventionals. We are trying to understand altogether. Uh, what I am presenting here is my 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 uh, you know my uh, what I have been uh, doing, uh, and in 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 trying to understand how these unconventional uh, reservoirs they uh, they behave, and definitely uh, fluids. If we understand that fluids is the organic matter that is there, definitely organic matter is also going to make a a big uh, effect on this. Uh, um, Parameters like uh, Poisson ratio and Young and Young models. Okay, it says for measurement of geomechanical properties, have they been compared to experimental data? Data and of course, yes. Uh, uh, I didn't show that information, but there was there was data, there was uh, core data that it, it, it. If you go to some of the references that I I post at the end of the in the last slide, there is core data and, and that information was, uh, we were able to, to calibrate that with core data. So uh, answering your question, yes, very good question because it is important for everyone to, to make sure that we, what we are doing, it follows some, some path and some logical treatment in order to allow us to continue with some level of confidence. So answering to your question, yes, we were able to do that and, and you can find uh, uh, information uh, about that uh, there, okay, in, in those references. It says uh, high TOC in combination with high brilliance is, is counterintuitive. Yes, uh, that, yeah, that, that is the uh, that is the, the, the what it is said. I mean, definitely uh, uh, for those of you who have been exposed to this analysis before, uh, definitely something that happens when we see that behavior, it doesn't look like uh, it's following what we are expecting. And that is because of the of the organic matter that is there. Um, um, basically, uh, there is if, if you uh, again, if if uh, uh, there is um, um, wh what I am doing is um, uh, following some um, um, remarks or some findings from uh, former researchers that they found that not necessarily the presence of TOC 
is going to create that the the uh, the rock is going to become ductile as it is expected. So um, uh, there are uh, some uh, laboratory analysis that they show that this behavior is not necessarily true. So um, uh, that, that is what we are also finding here with this information based on, on web logging. Uh, and and uh, because of that, we were able to claim that uh, uh, that uh, counterintuitive uh, behavior uh, definitely is uh, is created by the presence of uh, organic matter and is something that tells that uh, is telling us that that, that that particular section of the well is of great interest. It says does this approach um, provide for location fractures with depleted pressure due to offset production in a parent well? Um, really hard to answer this question. I don't know if um, definitely uh, from, from uh, production from a parent well, if uh, in order to do that, we need to to, to have different uh, uh, um, in time. With time, we need to measure uh, parameters with time. It implies that we, we should uh, run tools uh, um, on, uh, on different periods of time in order to, to, to understand and to measure that behavior. So, uh, if we have this, that information, we should be able to do that because the diffusivity question allows you to, to measure as, as time changes. So theoretically, we can. Unfortunately, the lack of information that we, we uh, uh, have all the time from horizontal wells is that is something that is going to really uh, basically prevent that can be done. But uh, definitely, uh, it can be done if information is available. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to thank our speaker today, Dr. Alberto Lopez. Um, so thanks for a really great talk. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers for attending and um, asking some really good questions. Uh, we encourage you to share this um, uh, webinar that will appear on YouTube. So share it with your colleagues and um, please join us again next month, uh, the second Tuesday of the month at noon. So uh, thank you, everyone.